Hi, I'm Kenny Yates. Welcome to Hold the Hope. And this is our regular weekly message. And today's message is entitled, Jesus, the Spirit of Love. This is our second message in our Christmas series, Jesus is the Reason for the Season. And the portion of scripture that we chose for our text this morning is not your typical Christmas scripture, but if you think about it, this text, this portion of scripture is the epitome of Christmas. What I mean is this, Christmas is all about love. It's all about giving. And to a certain point, it's all about receiving. Why do I say receiving? Well, if everybody gave, but no one wanted to receive, who would we give to? Think about that. So in order for us to give, you must have a recipient to give to. So with that said, please turn with me to a very, very familiar portion of scripture, which is known as John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. This is Jesus speaking to a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus a ruler of the Jews, who came to Jesus at night to question him. Now, he was not questioning Jesus as the Pharisees did or, or the other Pharisees did, trying to find a fault with Jesus or trying to trip him up in his word, trying to catch Jesus out. This was not what Nicodemus was doing. You see, Nicodemus was genuinely interested in what Jesus had to say, but he was afraid of the Jews. He was afraid of his fellow Pharisees. So he came to Jesus under cover of night. Nicodemus had heard Jesus' previous messages about eternal life, and he believed in eternal life. He sought eternal life. He even taught about eternal life. But there was something different about this teacher, Jesus of Nazareth. So. Nicodemus went to find out what it was. What made the difference with Jesus? Because he taught like no other teacher. So Jesus begins to explain to Nicodemus about the new birth, about being born again. Responding to Nicodemus' question, the scripture states in John chapter 3, verse 3, Jesus answered and said to him, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. See, Nicodemus was under the concept or thought that what Jesus was saying about being born again was physically. He thought it, it, it meant to physically go back into someone's mother's womb and be physically born again. But on the contrary, Jesus was talking about a spiritual new birth. He was talking about being born again spiritually. So Jesus told him that unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So during the course of that explanation, Jesus utters these famous words. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. If you're willing to accept this, Jesus is speaking of the very first Christmas present. For God so loved that He gave. See, Christmas is all about giving. We give gifts or we exchange gifts with each other because God first gave to us the greatest Christmas present of all, eternal life. His Son, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. So no doubt, Jesus is the reason for the season. See, we often think of Jesus as the one who loves and he does, make no mistake of that, Jesus does love us, otherwise he would not have come. But we don't often equate that same depth of love 
to the Father. But look at who actually loved. Jesus himself said, for God so loved. Not that Jesus so loved that he came. Nor did it say that the Holy Spirit so loved that he brought. On the contrary, it says, for God the Father so loved that he gave his only begotten Son. See, without Christ, there is no Christmas, no Christmas. Without the Son willing to come to earth to die for our sins, there would be no salvation, therefore no Christmas, therefore no presents, because we would not have anything to celebrate, and the old devil would not have need to tempt us into sinning, because we would all be headed for one place. We would be headed straight for the lake of fire. But one glorious day, in the fullness of time, the king of glory stepped out of eternity and stepped into time, splitting time in two, dividing time by his miraculous death into B.C. and A.D. A.D. stands for Anno Domini which is Latin for in the year of our Lord. This is what we're living in, the year of our Lord, because Jesus reigns. And B.C. means before Christ. Or a better understanding is before the birth of Jesus Christ. Because really, there was never a time before Jesus. Jesus did not come into being at his birth. Christmas is not the celebration of Jesus coming into being. Jesus was from eternity. Look at Micah's prophecy of the coming Messiah found in Micah chapter 5 verse 2. We're going to read from the NIV. But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel whose origins are from old, from ancient times. You see, Jesus' origins did not begin in a manger in Bethlehem, Ephrathah. He was from eternity and will be to eternity. This is what Jesus says about himself in John chapter 17, verse 5. And now, Father, he prays, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you from when? Before before the world existed. Here Jesus is confirming that he had glory and lived in that glory before the world was even created. The world hadn't even been created yet and Jesus existed. See, Jesus existed from eternity and he will exist to eternity. In other words, Jesus has no beginning and Jesus has no end. He was with the Father, and that's how the Father was able to give. You cannot give something you do not have. If Jesus did not exist before his birth 2,000 years ago, then God could not have given what he did not possess. But because Jesus did exist, God gave, and God gave because God loved. I heard a story several years back about a son who was given the gift that he dearly wanted, but because it did not appear to him to be what he envisioned it to be, he did not accept it. He didn't see the gift, so he spurned the thing he most desired, the thing that he most longed for, he walked away from. The story goes like this. A young man was getting ready to graduate from college. For many months, he had admired a beautiful sports car in a dealer's showroom. And knowing his father could well afford it, he told him, that car, that sports car is the only thing I want for my graduation. As graduation day approached, the young man awaited signs that his father had purchased the car for him. Finally, on the morning of his graduation, his father called him into his private study. His father told him how proud he was. I'm proud of you, son. You're such a fine son. And he told him how much he loved him. 
and he handed his son a beautifully wrapped gift box. So curious and somewhat disappointed, the young man opened the box and found a lovely leather-bound Bible with his name embossed in gold. But instead of being glad, being thankful, being happy, the young man became angry. He raised his voice to his father and he said, With all your money, you give me a Bible? And he stormed out of the house. Many years passed and the young man was very successful in business. He had a beautiful home and a wonderful family. But he realized his father was getting very old and thought perhaps he should go to him. He had not seen him since the graduation day. Before he could make the arrangements to go though, he received a telegram telling him his father had passed away and had willed all of his possessions to his son. He needed to come home immediately and take care of things. When he arrived at his father's house, sudden sadness and regret filled his heart. He began to search through his father's important papers and saw the still gift-wrapped Bible, just as he left it all of those years ago. With tears, he opened the Bible and began to turn the pages. His father had carefully underlined a verse, Matthew chapter 7, verse 11. It reads, And if ye, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father, which is in heaven, give to those who ask him? As he read those words, a car key dropped from the back of the Bible. It had a tag with the dealer's name and the same dealer who had the sports card he had desired. On the tag with the date of his graduation and the words were written, paid in full. I want you to look at the verse that was so carefully underlined. Matthew chapter 7 verse 11. If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask Him? See, the Father will give good things to those who ask Him. He is our Heavenly Father. Jesus in chapter 5 verse 19 said that He does whatever He sees the Father doing. And whatever the Father does, He too does the same thing. Thing. Therefore, if the Father gives good things to those who ask, the Son too will give good things to those who ask. For Jesus said in John chapter 14, verse 13 through 14, that whatever we ask Him in His name, He will do it for us. Because in doing so, the Father will be glorified. See, Jesus is the spirit of giving. The father in the story we just told knew how to give good gifts. He wanted his son to have a nice, beautiful sports car. He wanted to give that car to his son, and he did. But at the same time, he wanted him to have something spiritual as well. The son, however, was spoiled. He was selfish and could not see the value of the Bible. He could only see his own selfish desires, so he left the very thing he most desired lying on his father's desk, still wrapped in the gift box. That is how it will be for some at the end of time. The thing that they're chasing the most, a good life, personal needs like clothes, apparel, accessories, food, housing, wealth, worldly wealth, etc. Jesus has paid for all of that for you. We get even more than just a good life though. We get eternal life. 
with all the benefits that come with it. We won't need for anything because all of our needs will be supplied by Jesus who will give us all things because Jesus is the spirit of giving. Christmas is all about giving, but as I said earlier, it also is about receiving. The father in the story gave his son the thing that his son most desired, but his son, being short-sighted, did not receive the gift, thus took away the father's privilege to give the one thing to his son, which his son most desired. Thus, the Christmas message can be summed up in these words found in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given. That is the Christmas message. Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. It always comes back to that word and its various forms. Give, given, has given, will give, gave. Our God is a loving and given God who gave the most valuable possession he had, his son, Jesus. He is a kind and compassionate God. He delights in blessing his children with good things. What did the verse we read earlier, what did it say? How much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask Him? See, James tells us that we have not because we ask not. And when we do ask, we ask amiss. Wanting only to selfishly and greedily squander it all on ourselves. But I'm here to tell you, we don't even need to ask Him. All we have to do is be obedient to him and follow his laws. R.G. Letourneau, born in 1888, was a Christian industrialist who took seriously his call to be a businessman for God. He invented, designed, and developed his own line of earth-moving equipment, and he held hundreds of patents over his lifetime. Letourneau designed and built 70% of the heavy earth-moving equipment used in World War II. He and his wife, Evelyn, who also conducted Bible studies, started Christian youth camps, counseled, fed, and even housed the young man her husband employed. Together, they made a decision to give more and more of their wealth. They began to give away their wealth until they reversed tithe, meaning they gave 90% of their income and lived on the remaining 10. R.G. Letourneau is quoted as saying, I shovel out the money and God shovels it back. But God has a bigger shovel. That is the true Christmas spirit that Jesus brought into the world is the spirit of giving. Letourneau said, I shovel out the money and God shovels it back, but God has a bigger shovel. God is a debtor to no man. He's no man's debtor. Whatever a man gives to God, God will repay with interest. You can never, ever outgive God. Like Letourneau said, God has a bigger shovel, and God's not afraid to use the shovel. He wants to use his shovel. He wants to use that big shovel to shovel back to you what you're shoveling out with your little shovel. Because Jesus is the spirit of giving. So this Christmas, Get out and enjoy some Christmas programs. Support your local churches and go see the beautiful Christmas light displays. 
Say Merry Christmas. Do not let political correctness keep you quiet. Say Merry Christmas. Because Christ, Jesus, is the reason for the season. And do not forget, even with all the celebrations, even with all the festivities and the gift exchanges, do not forget to give to those who are less fortunate than yourself. Remember that you can never, ever outgive God because God has a bigger shovel than you do. And he has a greater resource than you do. So give with a cheerful heart. Give out of love for your Lord and Savior. And I want to extend to you this. If you have not accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, now this Christmas season would be the best time to do so. The end of the age is rushing upon us. Maybe some here in this do not understand or maybe they're not familiar with these terms that we use like Jesus as a personal savior or the approaching end of age. Well, to have Jesus as your own personal savior means you accept Jesus as Lord and savior. And to do so, all you have to do is to ask him to forgive you of your sins to forgive you of your transgressions, and He will. He is just waiting for you to come to Him and to ask. But someone will say, well, why don't He just forgive me without me asking? Well, you see, Jesus does not infringe on your free will. It's your choice to choose Him or not to choose Him. And you choose Him by coming to Him and asking for forgiveness. He doesn't just take it upon Himself. You must ask. And the approaching end of the age is the time when Jesus will return to get us, when he comes back to redeem us out of this world. The early Christians called it the blessed hope. That's the time when Jesus will break the eastern sky and, and receive unto himself everyone who is waiting for him, everyone who has accepted him as Lord and Savior, everyone who is bought by his blood, by receiving him, asking for forgiveness. And there we will be with him forever and ever, never more to die, never more to be hungry or thirsty, never more to be tired and worn out and not having enough, lacking in things. Never again will that happen to you in eternity because Jesus will supply all of your needs. Now those who reject Jesus, will be sentenced to an eternity in the lake of fire. But if you think about it, they have chosen that because Jesus has laid before them life and death, and they chose death. It's not Jesus' choice, it's your choice. So if you're hearing my voice today, choose life. I encourage you, choose life, choose Jesus. So. If you want to live with Jesus forever and ever, all you have to do is to ask. Ask by repeating this prayer after me. Heavenly Father, forgive me of my sins. I come to you and I ask you, give me eternal life. I accept your eternal life now. In Jesus' name, amen. It's just a simple prayer. Asking for forgiveness, receiving his eternal life. Make it a move towards Jesus, and Jesus will come running to you, and he will receive you, he will cleanse you, he will save you. What you need to do now is to get a Bible, read your Bible. That's how you get to know Jesus. That's how you learn what Jesus expects, what he's looking for when he comes back. Because Jesus is not just coming back for any old people, he's coming back for a blood bought, a white, spotless, without wrinkled bride. That's what we have to be. We can't live however we want in all kind of sexual immorality and whatever else that we live in. We can't live like that anymore. We do not live like the world. We do not talk like the world. We spend time with Jesus. 
We spend time in His presence through prayer, through worship, through meeting together at church and worshiping, corporate worship. These are the things that draw us close to Jesus and Jesus to us. And when He comes back, He'll say, well done, my good and faithful servant. But what you need to do is to find a Bible-believing church and join that church. Be discipled in that church. And when Jesus comes back, you'll be ready to meet him. So thank you so much for joining us. I want to wish each and every one of you Merry Christmas. Enjoy the holidays. Enjoy the Christmas season. Say Merry Christmas to people you meet. Say Christmas, Merry Christmas in the grocery store or in a department store, wherever you go. Put a smile on your face. Jesus lives. He came. He died. He rose again. And he's coming back for us. Thank you so much. The Lord bless you. I'm Kenny Yates. This is Hold the Hope. Be blessed and stay blessed.